110 of the Andean Health Organization Equality Agreement, or ASCONO. It is already three and a half years of continuous interlearning since we started this webinar cycle in May 2020. Today, Thursday, February 29, 2024, we are pleased to present the webinar entitled Comprehensive Care of the Small Vulnerable Newborn, an update. In the Andean Health Organization, Hippolyte Non Agreement, we promote health and well being. For us, it is a priority to contribute to ensure that public policies are effective in guaranteeing human rights, especially the rights of boys, girls, and adolescents. In this context, it is necessary to highlight an important concept that contributes to well being, and that, and that is positive peace, which not only implies the absence of violence, but also the presence of conditions that favor comprehensive human development. It is essential for the well-being and health of people, as it allows the rights to be respected, their needs to be met, and their capabilities to be enhanced. It also contributes to preventing and reducing risk factors that affect physical, mental, and social health, such as poverty, inequality, discrimination, stress, and trauma. Therefore, from the Andean Health Organization, the Polito Nano Agreement, we promote positive peace as a fundamental value to achieve comprehensive, sustainable health in our region. Likewise, it is essential to strengthen the intersectoral and transdisciplinary work capacities, regional integration, and international cooperation to make social and environmental justice a reality, as well as to understand that boys, girls, and adolescents are not the future, they are the present. We firmly believe that the One Health approach and their life course in order to achieve the highest possible level of health. Remember that what we do now will uh, impact the development and he health care of our populations. Reflections on these and other priorities relevant to health and well-being can be found in the newsletter Noti Salud Andinas, monthly edition, available on the website of our institution and in the Andean Integration Knowledge Showcase. We invite you to leave your name, organization, and country from which you're joining us through the comment box or the Facebook, la Facebook or YouTube live chat. In the same space, you can leave your questions or send them via email at webinarorasconu at gmail.com. To access the certificate of attendance to this webinar, as usual, you must fill out a short survey and leave your data in the fixed link that are in the Facebook or YouTube live chats. Please remember to verify that your email is spelled correctly. This webinar will begin with the institutional greeting, then the presentations of our speakers and the space for questions and answers. Well, to begin this important day, I give the floor to Dr. Maria Carmen Calle. Executive Secretary of the Andean Health Organization. Go ahead, Dr. Calle. Thank you very much, Marianela. Well, morning to all of you, or good afternoon, or good evening. For the Andean Health Organization, Hippolyte Nano Agreement, neonatal health is a priority, and we are committed to continue working in place and make this issue visible in the public agenda of the Andean region. Neonatal health policies and interventions are key for the cognitive, physical, and emotional development of human beings. And these cannot be separated from those related to the life course of women since the protection of their health during adolescence. Gestation, childbirth, and puerperium are factors that influence the health of the newborn. 
since 2020 in a joint effort with the support of PAHO WHO, hospitals and institutes of reference in neonatal health, such as the St. Joseph Denver, the Vermont Oxford Network Collaborative Center, and a group of expert advisors in quality projects. The human resources of the neonatal ICU has been trained in the development of quality projects in hospital acquired infections, antimicrobial resistance, and nutrition in premature infants. To date, the Oras CONU has a neonatal health course under the methodology of quality improvement projects of potentially best practices apply, apply to the NICU. For this year, 2024, the Neonatal Health Working Group made up by resolution, created by resolutions of ministers of the Andean region has defined the following priorities. Strengthening maternal perinatal care, strengthening the kangaroo and breastfeeding programs, prevention and care of premature birth, continuity in the implementation of quality improvement programs in neonatal ICUs. Against this background, it is timely to learn about the results of the study of vulnerable small newborns published by the Lancet in 2023, where it is evidence that indeed being born too small or too early is an important risk factor for poor health and other adverse consequences that affect the future of children. We will then address the importance of follow-up from the perspective of neonatal risk, which involves integrated and interdisciplinary effort. Finally, we will socialize successful experiences such as the kangaroo method, a model of safe and humanized care with an important cost-benefit ratio, which allows not only a greater survivor, but also a better quality of life. Thank you for your participation to Per Ashford, Professor of Pediatrics and Director of the Research Care for Child, Adolescent and Maternal Health at the University of Tampere in Finland, Dr. Monica Morges, President and Founding Member of the Latin American Association for Pediatric and Neonatal Follow-up of Chile, and Dr. Nathalie Charpak, Founder, Director and Head of Research of the Kangaroo Foundation of Colombia. Once again, welcome to all of you. Thank you, dear, dear Dr. Calle. After the greeting, I introduce myself. My name is Marianela Villalta, coordinator for the neonatal health area of the Andean Health Organization. And today, with great pressure, I will be in charge of the moderation. After this preamble, we welcome Dr. Per Ashhorn. Per Ashhorn works as professor of pediatrics and director of the Center for Child, Adolescent, and Maternal Health Research at Tampere University in Finland. And as a part, it's a chief physician at the Department of Pediatrics at Tampere University Hospital. He's a specialist in pediatrics and pediatric infectious diseases. He has worked in, as a laboratory scientist, Dr. Asher, work in the WHO and has conducted several research on maternal and infant health, with a special, special emphasis in the interaction between infections, premature labor, and the malnutrition. He has published more than 300 scientific articles supervise graduate and postgraduate students in the thesis work. It's a pleasure to have you with us, Dr. Per Ashner. You have the floor. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Dr. Vilalta. It's an honor uh, to be a part of this webinar. And I wanted to share with you uh, some information on an article series that was first published in 
um, May last year, and then there was a regional launch uh, in Peru in November. And this is a series that, as earlier mentioned, focuses on small vulnerable newborns, newborns who are born too soon or too early. And we have a special focus on prevention. In the other uh, webinars or the lectures after, after myself, you'll focus more on management of the small babies, and I will focus on the prevention. You can find uh, a full sort of booklet, all the five articles in a web page that is shown here under the Lancet web page. You can also find a four page uh, executive summary in there. And the executive summary you can find not only in English, but also in French and Spanish translations. And as you will notice, I will speak in English, but the slides have been translated for the Lima event um, to be in Spanish. Now, before I go on, I should say that I represent a very large consortium called Small Vulnerable Newborn Consortia. And you are seeing in this picture some of the lead authors of the Lancet series. Not all of them are in this picture. And you see the home organizations. And I should acknowledge not only them, but all the 55 authors who contributed to the series and actually 200 more authors who provided data and, and, and also participated as, as group authors in the production of all the articles. And special thanks, of course, go to our funder, SIF, Children's Investment Fund Foundation, and Miriam Sabin and Richard Horton, our editors from The Lancet, uh, and other staff at The Lancet Without, whose tireless efforts uh, the papers could not have been published. Now, the series consists of four full papers and a comment. The full papers, the first one of them, lays out the foundation why are we interested in small vulnerable newborns? The second one goes into the epidemiology, why well, common is the problem. The third one looks at biochemistry a bit on the pathways that connect different adverse exposures to being born too small or too soon. And then we have uh, a review of the current evidence for various interventions. What could one do to prevent the birth of a small vulnerable newborns. And finally, there's a call to or call for action uh, in the form of the commentary. And I will describe rather superficially, but I will go through all these five papers. The first one is entitled Small Vulnerable Newborns, Big Potential for Impact. And as I said, it's an introduction to the topic and it has five main messages. The first one is that there are three different constructs to define uh, vulnerable newborns who are somehow small. Low birth weight, preterm birth, and small for gestational age. And in our paper, we show how these different constructs have developed over the past 100 years as a function of changing knowledge, improving technology, and changing priorities among health professionals. And although all these different definitions are slightly different and the management for the different groups might be slightly different. Uh, their origins and consequences are largely the same. And therefore, for public health purposes, you can combine them into an entity. Now, our second message is that despite there have been many global commitments and agreements to reduce the proportion for instance, of low birth weight babies, latest in 12, 2012 W World Health Assembly Global Nutrition Targets, there actually hasn't been much progress. This is evidence, for instance, this slide where we show the annual number of babies with low birth weight uh, in the last 20 years. And you will see that it has remained uh, around 20 million or a bit more than 20 million throughout this period. There's a little bit of reduction in terms of numbers in Asian uh, area, but that is because the number of births has come down rather than that the proportion of vulnerable babies would have changed to any degree. The third uh, message we have is that this lack of progress can be attributed to the failure of the global community to adequately respond to four challenges that any network needs to address 
if they want to advance their cause. Problem definition, positioning, coalition building and governance. Problem definition means coming to an evidence-informed consensus of what the actual problem is and how best address it. And positioning means framing the issue in a way that attracts uh, the key stakeholders who can make a change. And we argue that the three different definitions for small babies has uh, obscured the true magnitude of the problem and made it difficult to come up with a, a consensus of what to do. Furthermore, there has been an, an uh, emphasis on management and not so much on uh, prevention. Secondly, framing the issue, the preterm SGA, preterm birth and low birth weight, mostly as a pediatrician's medical problem and a management question has meant that major stakeholders who are interested in equity, human rights, human capital, uh, and even economic development, the nation have not joined the coalition and the coalition to make the change has remained too narrow. We go in more details in these issues in the paper, but in the interest of time, I won't go uh, into those details now. What we propose as a solution is a new framework where we combine the three earlier constructs under a new umbrella term, small vulnerable renewables. And this framework is familiar to you from other public health problems, perhaps, that there are contextual factors like poly, uh, uh, poverty or political instability, uh, high food prices, that then make people, girls and women, uh, susceptible for adverse exposures like undernutrition or repeated infections. Those can lead to two adverse pathways, too early birth to preterm delivery or fetal growth restriction. And then the babies can be preterm, small for gestational age, or both preterm SGA. And many, although not all of those babies will be low birth. And on the top line, you see that uh, as the consequences, there are these immediate problems, neonatal mortality, neonatal morbidity, but also later consequences to the child, meaning growth problems, development of problems, illnesses in childhood, and also chronic illnesses in adulthood. And for the society, this means reduce education, reduce income, reduce human capital, and shorten life. So it's not only a problem of those individuals, but it's actually a problem of the whole society. And this is illustrated in the last fifth picture that out of vulnerable mothers, out of vulnerable fetuses, come small vulnerable babies uh, for small vulnerable newborns and small and vulnerable uh, children, vulnerable adults, and vulnerable societies. And the last message that we have is a positive one that this intergenerational cycle can be broken. If we actually provide uh, investment into the maternal and child health, and we have thriving newborns, that leads to thriving children, thriving adults, and thriving societies. So there is a positive possibility, but it requires looking into this question. Now, the second paper then looks at the uh, epidemiology, and I have to jump over some of the less sort of, I would say, critical issues in this paper. But the first message here is that if you look at the whole world, more than 35 million babies out of all the 135 million annual births uh, belong to this category of small vulnerable newborns. So more than every fourth baby is born either too soon or too small or both. The second message is what I already said. This is now showing the preterm births. There has been no change in the last 20 years. Uh, and for the SGA, for the small for gestational age babies, we don't have the estimate that's present. But out of all those small vulnerable newborns, the biggest majority, there are about 14 million preterm babies, but more than 20 million SGA babies. And if you then go into the different parts of the world, if you look at here, the bottom part, you saw the global numbers, uh, 26 million, 26% uh, and 35 million. 
If you go then to Southern Asia, it's actually 50% of the babies. Every second baby is born small. These are mostly SGA babies, and that means 18.8 million babies in Asia. And if we take the region that is sort of of major interest to this audience today, it is now 16% of all babies. Every sixth baby is born either too soon or too small, and that was more than a million and a half babies every year in the uh, Caribbean and Latin American region. And this is a bit busy slide, and, and perhaps you don't need to look at all the details, but just to mention that out of the 2.3 million neonatal deaths that take place in the world, uh, more than 50%, 1.4, are attributable to being born small or too small, uh, too soon or too small. And the great majority of these take place in Sub-Saharan Africa or Southern Asia. There are some also in Latin American and Caribbean areas, but luckily that is that is less. Now, the third paper in the series is then, as I said, about the pathways, the physiological pathways leading to the birth of small vulnerable newborn. And this perhaps I will, this would require more time to go into the details of the bio, biochemical pathways. But the key point here is that there has been a myth quite largely among at least pediatricians, I don't know so well about obstetricians, but but that being born SGA, being born small, so fetal growth restriction, it would be mostly about maternal undernutrition and preterm delivery or preterm birth would mostly be about maternal infections and uh, other maternal conditions. And when you actually look at, at the biological pathways, this is not the case. If, for instance, if you look at the fetal growth restriction to grow, a fetus needs genetic uh, instructions. These nutritions need hormones that give the machinery in, uh, to put the nutrients together. And finally, you need energy. The energy comes from oxygen uh, and sugar uh, that you need to burn. The, and the oxygen to the baby comes from the mother through blood through placenta. And if you have any problem in maternal lungs or in the placenta, you won't get oxygen and the baby will not grow. Likewise, the placenta um, quite to a large degree uh, affects what nutrients go through and what hormones are injected. So it's far from being singularly about the nutrition, but it's nutrition, health, infections, and everything like that. And we can show similar pictures for how preterm birth is also influenced by several different pathways. And that means that if you actually want to prevent any of these pathways and you want to prevent the preterm uh, or uh, SGA babies, it won't work that you only work in the infection box or that you only provide nutrients. Uh, if you are medical in the medical field, you have to think of all these boxes. And likewise, if you are in the politician field or public health person and you think of what are the causes of causes, it won't help if you only work on agriculture, but you actually have to think broadly in different sectors. And the negative part of that, that you need wide interventions. The positive thing is that what I'm going to show you in the next slides about interventions, they are all from single intervention studies. And it is very likely that if you actually did these combination studies, which have been very rare so far, that we could get even better results that we have received from the current interventions. And the current interventions are then uh, highlighted in paper number four, where the group uh, led by Justice Hoffmeyer and Bob Black, but there were many others involved, did a wide survey of uh, literature searches and eventually concluded that there are eight simple interventions that are not very expensive uh, that could be used and millions of vulnerable births would be prevented. Some of these interventions like multiple micronutrient supplementation, uh, screening for bacteria, screening of syphilis would be targeted for all women and others like balanced energy uh, and protein or low dose aspirin would be targeted to some risk individuals or some risk context. And we have counted that if you scaled up those eight interventions in 81 lower mid-income countries, 
to 90% coverage from their present coverage, you would avoid about 15 to 20% of all SVN births, that means 5.2 million, and also uh, avoid half a million stillbirths, half a million neonatal deaths, uh, four, 5 million uh, cases of stunting at the total cost of something like $1 billion per year, which means per death is about 2,400, which is considered cost-effective. There are also some un yet unproven but potential interventions, and if you scale up those, the benefits would be even larger. And as I said, if multi-pronged interventions most likely would be even more beneficial. So if you put everything together, this summarizes the four pages that we're talking about the big problem that causes a lot of mortality, but also many other adverse outcomes. There hasn't been progress despite global uh, commitments. Uh, and do we have evidence that 15 to 20% could be knocked out with existing interventions and probably with, with combined interventions even more? So then the question is what to do. And uh, the last comment is about a call to action. And, and the authors propose uh, a strategy built on three pillars, recognition of the problem, implementation interventions, and increased accountability. And again, I won't have time to go very deeply in uh, there are international recommendations and national recommendations in each one of these pillars. Uh, so problem recognition would require from an international agency like WHO to, to make, provide good guidelines on prevention and uh, summary of what the problem is. And then there should be a national plan with an, a, a budget in the existing health system, how to tackle the problem. In, and then we have provided some interventions that we suggest that should be implemented uh, on the local level. And of course, that's part of the uh, universal health coverage in the countries. And on an international level, there should be sufficient funding both to support those programs uh, and to support further research on the promising new interventions. And then the last part is about accountability. And, and on an international level, that means provision of international statistics and probably providing a forum where these this, this, uh, prevention issues could be discussed further. And on a national level, this means weighing, uh, dating all pregnancies and weighing all babies so that you could get the, the statistics and then mounting that multi-sectoral uh, uh, whole society action to improve the situation. Now, since the publication of the series, we've actually seen many new studies that are, these are from the Lancet Small Vulnerable University in Nepal. This was published uh, a couple of weeks ago. Last week, there was a vulnerable newborn phenotypes in Peru in Lancet Regional Health uh, that came out just a week ago. So the scientists have clearly uh, adopted the new terminology very much. And now the question is, will the countries do it? Because what we have written here in the cover of the executive summary is the key point, that the fact that every fourth baby in the world is born too soon or too small is a concern for human rights, public health, national economy and development. By not addressing this priority, we feel that we are jeopardizing our collective future. And the other key point is here, the time to act is now. Ahora, every baby, Every family, every society has the right to survive and thrive. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, very much. I will stop sharing and give it the floor back to the chairperson. Muchas gracias, Dr. Per Arsenal. Thank you very much, Dr. Arsenal. Great, great. And thanks for your wonderful presentation. Actually, the situation that you have presented is quite serious. Although there's been some progress in child infant morbid mortality has not been reflected in the neonatal area. And as you have mentioned, we need timely responses. And perhaps that topic has to do with definitions that put us away from the real problem. And so this call of action is very important. 
recognize that there is a problem and to carry out interventions and finally the accountability. I think that this is a key topic for all of us. One of the things that guides our work, the Andean Health Organization, we have received many congratulations and questions. So we will ask you to please stay in the room and at the end of the presentations, we will have a Q&A session. Thank you very much, Doctor. Now we're going to welcome Dr. We would like to welcome Dr. Monica Morges. Dr. Monica Morges is a pediatrician and neonatologist with a master's degree in public health. She's a professor at the University of Chile. She was president of the follow-up committee of the Chilean Society of Pediatrics. She has also been president of the Ibero-American Society of Neonatology. He is currently president and founding member of the Latin American Association of Pediatric and Neonatal Follow-up. It's the other extremely important field. And thank you very much for your participation, Dr. Monica. I think that the risk approach of the newborn is going to be important for this webinar. Go ahead, Dr. Monica. Thank you very much. It is an honor and a pleasure to share with you this vision that we believe this is a one that we need to promote in order to optimize the limited resources, especially the human resource, the well-trained resource is an issue in our Latin American region. I put some reflections because the risk approach is going to take us to optimize and to focus in the populations that require to have a special look. Not only small children or premature and small babies, but there's also other important subjects in our region, such as hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, children that undergo major surgery, children that subject to special interventions, even children with significant jaundice that are at risk of committing their neurodevelopment or compromising their neurodevelopment. They are at risk of having a cerebral palsy and also high risk for chronic pulmonary disease and nutritional problems, especially those who require ventilatory support in neonatal intensive care. So it is important to have this vision. I'm going to time. So it is important to have this vision and uh, follow up significant, significantly on a timely basis so we can diagnose and rule out because if the child and we rule out any risk that interdisciplinary time team has more time to focus on more controls and studies in children who require or who have any issue. First and the most basic is an adequate nutrition post to provide growth retardation to add to the intrauterine growth retardation a higher risk because there's a malnutrition that is added to the prenatal malnutrition. So the do a adequate delivery of protein to the needs of mother, mother's own milk and support with special milk for premature infants. We know that prematures require support with fortification and special milk once they are discharged. So this parameter of nutrition is extremely important because we, we know that a child with good nutrition has well neurodevelopment, better IQ. 
like we can see in this graph, maternal milk per se also induces a better neurodevelopment. So we need to design the adequate strategy to rescue breast milk. And Dr. Cherpak will mention that in the kangaroo care, where we have an excellent response and excellent intervention. We know that children who have a good head circumference because it was corrected around 40 weeks are going to have a better IQ. Having extra uterine growth retardation adds nutritional risk, and you can see how the pediatrics scale both motor as well as mental falls to the extent that there's more extra uterine malnutrition. So what has to do with nutrition should be our first goal around 40 weeks. Our child will have to be corrected between 40 and 44 weeks, especially the head circumference. The neurological risk in this concept comes from 1960 that because of the history, a child who's pre peri and postnatal history is more likely to present in the first years of life development problems, whether cognitive, motor sensory, or behavioral, sensitive or definitive. But the important in that any of these disorders, the even behavioral, psychiatric, or attention deficit, or autistic disorders, we will have been able to diagnose them adequately and on a timely basis for an early and efficient intervention. And classic medicine has in the physical exam measuring head circumference, as we mentioned, that correlates with IQ, but we also the cranial sutures, visual follow up, social interaction, suction reflex, cervical tone, posture of the thumbs, the world of general movements, and the myotatic reflex, reflexes. That's our toolbox of knowledge where we can start identifying the child that has alarm signs and forces us to look at him or her closer. The perinatal risk factors, as you know, and doctor clearly mentioned, gestational age, birth weight, by far the most important. But there's also to consider the days of intubation, the use of postnatal steroids, inotropes of a child who have a ductus and we require parental nutrition, total parental nutrition for a long time, that also adds an additional risk to these small children. And of course, septicemia, which is one of the major causes that generate death. What is more correlated with neurological risk is brain parenchymal injury and intracranial hemorrhage or a periventricular hemorrhage grade three or four with ventricular megaly the, in the leukomalacia in the white matter or subcortical lesions, both in the cortex of the cerebellum, are important predictor of neurological risk. So in our countries where we have difficulty to access images, we have a long way to go in order to provide the care with the best way. So we we need to see that this is observed between children who receive neonatal intensive care. If a child is small, it's going to have a risk, but it's not going to concentrate the severe disability unless there is this history of sustained ventilation or septicemia. So there is the dual risk for premature babies, both in middle income countries and 
compared to high income countries. There's a gap in our mid, mid income countries with high income countries. It's a gap that we need to bridge, and that has to do with access to quality medicine with all the tools. So what we have is a combination of validated tools to get deal with neurological risk on a timely basis, because it has to be very early, as, as early as third month of life, because it is at that moment where the interdisciplinary team of, of all the therapies, occupational therapy, and so many others audition, kinesiology, everyone are going to have an impact in the future development of the child. So how can we make an early diagnosis? Well, if we have the resources, MRI at 40 weeks, because we've seen that this, the image is more correlated, that has an 86 to 89% of sensitivity in order to find the child who's ill. The general, the pre general movements have a 98% sensitivity. Therefore, in our countries with limited resources, this training in general movements and in the Hammersmith test, which also has a high sensitivity of 90 of 93%, but has a 100% of specificity. So when you combine the early diagnosing, the small baby, both the Hammersmith test, as well as the pressure general movement, we have that we can catch 98% and we can, not 98%, we can find the one that's really ill. We can also make in more than over the age of five, the child Hammersmith, not a newborn Hammersmith. So this neurological systematized exam, 34 items as an area of orientation and behavior, tone and posture, tone patterns, reflexes, movements, and abnormal signs of classical neurology. That is why it's been so important and has so a good correlation for the future development of children. You can see that it can be applied at 25 weeks of age in this shaded area. What is the, the score and the creation that we can accept in each one of the items? And we know that the optimal score of a free term is greater 26 and the term is 30.5. So if I train in this test, that is not that complex and doesn't require resource, large resources, I'm going to have the possibility. You can see this term baby can follow with in a horizontal plane as well as the vertical plane can follow with his eyes. So with a different parts of this test, we can get closer to see who's abnormal. We can do an early intervention. We can see this cervical tone. We are committed to train in the use of these clinical tests that are easy to apply it doesn't require large resources, but can make the difference in our children where we're going to focus our resource and the human team that works with them in those who really need it. The general movement, in addition to the Hammersmith, which is a systematic examination, these general movements were has a, a the logically has a start and start at 22 weeks. And they have, but they have to be mild. It's a child, it's like dancing 
always have to be different and not repetitive with frequent changes in direction that wax and wane in intensity, strength, and speed. That it looks like they're dancing, has to be fluid, complex, and elegant. And this we have to start at 22 weeks because at 22 weeks we have return movement, but around week 40 we have the written in within or at, at 49 weeks of correct generational age, we see the fidgety movement that makes the child is telling us a more adequate neurodevelopment. Here we see two twins that you see how they move. Look at the lower limbs and the upper limbs. Look at the hands, fingers, how they movement in semicircles, their feet, how they clapping with their feet. Those little movements when this emerge are so important that they can rule out a cerebral palsy. But they are, yes, very important and with a great impact. So the evaluation of general movement predicted motor and cognitive outcomes with good accuracy for mild, moderate, and severe delays, it have a 98% sensitivity. You can see that this is different to the other child, very limited movement, half stereotype movements, doesn't move the upper limbs, doesn't turn, there's no, there are no repetitive abnormal movements. So we from our institution are offering the second course of a timely diagnosis with the tools that we have available to evaluate the newborn. And here we see our almost motionless preemie tends to extend the limbs. So it is our responsibility as a team to train because to the extent that we train, we can find a child that requires intervention. If it's normal, it's, it's going to be, continues to be normal. If it's a child that has impaired general movements, it could be, most of them become normal, but others don't. There's an absence of small movements at nine weeks of life of correct gestational age. We so don't see these small movements where they clap their hands and with the tongue and you don't, we don't see those movements. We have that that child, we has to get our attention and action in our interdisciplinary therapy because we can rescue if this is not gonna go to federal policy. So what we do with a good diagnosis, with general movement, we can focus our effort in those who really need it. Not only in the preemie, but also in this neuro image, we see the importance with regards to hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. So if in the image, we see the internal capsule of the caudatus nuclei is present, then they are going to have a better prognosis of the child who suffered a hypoxic event, but it requires that we do the intervention. If the child has more involvement, perhaps we're going to have suction disorders or motor disorders that are going to prevent them to have a fully normal life and will have some degree of limitation. So the image, imaging is very important. We have ultrasound, but it's very difficult to have access to MRI where the prognostic value has been stated. So 
although the neuroimaging animals correlate having the possibility of general movement the hammersmith we are proposing them as the most precise tool together with images examining the association between mri with general movement and with the hammersmith with the same cohort it was showed that abnormal mri findings at term age were were associated with the absence of impairment of general movements and the absence of an abnormal hammersmith at three or four months therefore these are tools that we from our post economic possibility we can be that can be extremely important and therefore allocate the find the risk as early as three months of corrected age because it has a long term consequences because if they have you're going to have less brain volume decrease in myelination and these differences persist into adolescence and when uh, interdisciplinary team in acts and guides the development of the child in this neuroplasticity window we're going to have a better outcome cerebral palsy the prevalence to 16 to 21 percent between 24 and 26 wing one out of five but in the older child or in the large child is much smaller if we do things correctly how to decide if this high risk of cerebral palsy which has an essential criterion such as imaging impairment in an additional criterion such as the abnormal neuroimaging or clinical history. The essential criteria can be demonstrated with a neurological exam. The premature discapacity has become a worldwide problem. The children who survive, the longer the survival, we're going to they accumulate, as Dr. mentioned in the previous talk, they're going to be vulnerable adults because if they're going to have a handicap in their neurodevelopment and cognitive and behavioral areas, we're going to have an increase of those populations that reach the, the adult life and in the early follow-up also present some issues. The American Society Pediatric Association has indicated that that's not all cerebral palsy, that's important to keep in mind because most of the issues that this group shows have to do with kills on the daily activities, such as manual dexterity, pointing and catching, the executive dysfunction, the alteration of neurosensorial integrations, and these alterations become evident later in children. We're not gonna see them in a three month old child. That is why at, at three months of age, we need to decide if they need any type of intervention. And then the follow-up needs to continue because all these things start after the age of two or in the school age. So it requires a longer follow-up. And therefore you can solve the problems in a timely basis. Who works about respiratory risk allocation? And this is that chronic pulmonary disease diagnosed with oxygen in a child at 36 weeks or more as mild, moderate. It's not correlated that we are facing a child with chronic pulmonary disease. So we send the consultation to the lung specialist and these prematures are going to go well but not to treat it as a chronic lung but if it is a severe dysplasia who has received at least mechanical ventilation up to 36 weeks 
mechanical ventilation, not CPAP, like mechanical ventilation, that severe type 2 is probably going to concentrate the chronic pulmonary disease. And this type 2 is very important to see who has pulmonary hypertension, because those who have pulmonary hypertension in the first year, they have higher risk of ended up with a tracheostomy or gastroclysis for nutrition, more hospitalizations, and there's no difference in early mortality, but it does have it in the later mortality. So to evaluate the severity of chronic lung disease is extremely important. And to look at this determinant, where there is a score, where we're going to focus our effort in those children who have a real correlation and a risk of chronic pulmonary disease. A child who has more than two hospitalization and require oxygen at home and pulmonary dilatation in health failure. That's a severe child. Instead, a moderate may be hospitalized once, home oxygen, but doesn't require ventilatory support, requires inhaled steroids and bronchodilators and symptoms of more than two questionnaires. All the rest are not chronic, are mild. So we need to focus them and we go back to images. MRI, you can see the reference is extraordinary paper, but in our countries, people that is trained for diagnosis with MRI, the child are very few, but we must know that there is this alternative present that MRI for small children exists and that we need to be able to grow and demanding the best because that benefits our children interdisciplinary and family center work is what's going to allow us to make this major leap in Latin America. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Borges. Thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. I rescue three important aspects of all the things that you've mentioned. But I think that the most important is the emphasis of early intervention for early treatments and the importance of a coordinated interdisciplinary focus on the family. All of these together with competent human resources, it's time to act because we are talking as the future of this child, the present and the future. Thank you so much for your presentation. Please stay in the room. There are many questions for you. Now we extend a warm welcome to Dr. Natalie Charpak. Dr. Natalie Charpak is a pediatrician and neonatal researcher. She's founder, director, and head of research at the Kangaroo Foundation and affiliate research professor at Honorem at the Universidad Pontificia Javeran in Bogota, Colombia. Dr. Charpak is the world's leading researcher and advocate of Kangaroo Mother Care, KMC. And she has received numerous prestigious awards, including the French Legion of Honor, the Carlos Slim Foundation of Health Award, and the Save the Children Health Innovation Award. We know that you are French and the government government offer you the nationality because of this contribution to pediatric research, to the constant development and world spreading of this model. It's a pleasure to have you with us. I think that with the two previous uh, presentations, with yours, we're going to complete a good, uh, complete aspect of this issue during this webinar. Thank you very much. <laughs> Perfecto. Un segundito. Eh, saco. Ah, no.
antes de sacar eso. ¿Usted ve mi ratoncito o no? Sí, my, my pointer. Bueno, no importa. No importa. Sí se ve. Ah, perfecto. Ah, es lo que quería saber. Porque hay unas tablas un poquito más complicadas. Muchas gracias por esta invitación. Thank you so much for this invitation. As you very well mentioned. Give me a second here. Give me a minute, please. I put. I would like to be able to advance my slides and it's not working. So, so thank you very much for this invitation. My apology for these technical problems. For me, it's a pleasure and it's always a pleasure. And I'm not gonna show you the results as you have invited me from an article that we published the previous year about the brain structure, but I'm gonna show you some new exploratory results that will be published in the Journal of Neonatology in a special edition about kangaroo. Being, I have the hope that that is going to help our colleagues, the neonatologist colleagues, to decide that we need to do kangaroo as early as possible for the longer possible time. That's why I have put this title. This is just to be, to make up the Dr. Ray who created this kangaroo mother method. And you see the Dr. Navarrete and Dr. Martinez, the three of them are the pioneers of the KMC. In 1978, the method has changed, but we need to acknowledge the pioneers. So the kangaroo method, I, ins I had three components. Kangaroo position, but we're not going to talk today. So, three components, kangaroo, kangaroo position, kangaroo nutrition, and it's more difficult, the maternal nutrition of the premature child. That is a very a complicated. In the, in the early exiting kangaroo position with close supervision, I'm gonna show you the outcomes with parents that went home with their baby in kangaroo position. The target population, all preterm or low birth weight infants. Because it's, here we agree that there are two stages, the hospital stage and the outpatient stage. So here, just to tell you that I remind you that to have 24 hours kangaroo in the kangaroo position, you, you need a lycra band or another type of support. We like the lycra band because a child can move like he was or she was in the mother's womb. So we have to insist on this need. I'm also gonna say a few words about the, K, the immediate K, KMC 
just those are two pictures that I'm going to show you of my colleague Kim Chi in the private hospital in Vietnam. She was doing immediate, immediate, immediate KMC with some very interesting results. So this is very interesting. I verified this data for children under below 1800, starting on 24 weeks, a mortality is of 8%. Here you can see the zero separation. I have videos, many things that I can share with you, but not here. You've, we've been doing 30 years of research on the kangaroo method. Almost all of these articles are in, in the meta-analysis and systematic reviews that we did in them and collaborated with many people. So there was a kangaroo method that was spread all over the place, play the world with quality. And the follow-up of the high risk, we just published at the end of last year, the results of the cohort of 57,000 children that we follow up to one year. And there's many things to get from it. The database is also available for those who are interested. This is the global position paper of WHO about the kangaroo method that was published last year with a guidelines for implementation strategy in favor of the immediate kangaroo. And it, this slide is just to indicate that it's costly. Latin America have good outcomes in neonatology and good neonatal units. And there should be a bed next to any intensive care unit, pensive. So we need to work all together to do it. But I have the hope that with the results that I'm going to show you, you're going to see how this is done. So the premature children, there it's a, a planetary emergency. They account for 10% of birth worldwide, but are responsible for 70% of the neonatal and infant mortality that are direct, directly or indirectly in the main cause of mortality in children under the age of five. And we know that if we can have some action on this low birth weight, birth in the United Nations has mentioned there hasn't been any change in the rate of premature birth and that's despite the technological progress. So two causes that could be responsible. One is multiple pregnancies, secondary to in vitro fertilization, secondary to a drop in mortality, or induced prematurity that ends up in a cesarean section. So there is pathology in Latin America we see in terms of convenience of the professionals and of the mothers, so they don't wait for 39 weeks. At 34 weeks, they do the cesarean sessions, and these are premature that shouldn't be premature babies. In some areas, there's 90% in some hospitals for, for C-sections for preemies. This is serious. And just recently, we are realizing that prematurity is responsible not only of motor sequelae, but also of the mole and uh, like long term effects of driving a car when they're adults behavior. And also, I will say that the misuse, the misuse of technology. It reduces mortality too, but increases the long-term way. And the neonatologists like to save 
the smallest children. Look at this, 100 grams. Look at a hundred percent risk of having cephalic. And when you see a child here, you should think in his or her brain. What you see here, it, when it's in our hands, between 24 and 40, the brain volume multiplies by 1.5. The cortex grows on the surface in a factor of four. Or here, the connections, the microscopic part. See, who thinks that there are 40,000 synapses per second connect in this child that is in the incubator alone with light and maybe pain and separated from the mother. So here we need to change our chip. We need to change our chip. We need to stop thinking that it's normal for a premature to have a smaller brain with less gray matter, with less white matter. Compare this term brain with the other that was born the term. It's not the same brain. We need to, the, it's been shown that an impoverished environment, there's an increase in the risk of cognitive deficits. So all we have to do is to create an environment that is that gives us a adequate sensory stimulation to the premature infant and makes a better connections. Now, it's not stimulation. And can we do to preserve and bring out the best psychomotor, sensory, emotional, and cognitive development potential? So here you see, because the kangaroo method stimulates the entire neurosensorial system. It's the ideal place for this brain to grow. And here's the voices, the milk, the breathing, the visual contact when it's breastfeeding, the position inflection. So you stimulate everything. And you need to remember that prematurity, even in the absence of complications, during the transition implies an alteration of brain organization and maturation. This wonderful article, please look, look, look for it. That explains everything in the brain of the premature. Being born premature is a first injury. And then you have the development of that brain outside the uterus on an injury that already installed. So we have a lot of work to do. And here it mentions what's visible in the MRI and what is invincible to MRI. There are many things that are invisible and are going to make that we're going to have sequelae. We know that the more prematures are going to have neurological deficit. Half of them have minor lesions behavior disorders, risk of psychiatric diseases. And then without education, they're gonna need educational support. And here I'm gonna show you these results, exploratory outcomes. This is a large study that we did. And here I show you results with quantitative data. My dream, I'm looking for funds, but the world is depressing. I would like to analyze the 200 neuroimages that we have. We have anatomical, functional DTI of these children that we recover from the kangaroo versus control randomized trial. And it's very difficult to get this funding. So what this exploratory data are showing us that in the kangaroo group, we recover a cohort of survivors who's much easier because they survive. The preemies survive more and there's more children. Here you have a analysis of the volume of the cerebral cortex in children under the weight of 1800 versus control. The total volume of the cortex and the gray 
green volume of gray matter. You see that they're all significant. Children who had kangaroo had more volume. And from that, we would like to see, or we wanted to see, how these models have been built. Because I'm not going to repeat. We have always control. I don't know if you can see. If you see here, there's a variable with neonatal data before randomization. This is like the severity of the neonatal disease. And we have articles where we explain how this was calculated. And here, we are going to have control by sex because there are more children, boys who have a larger head, and we need to control severity by sex. And here, you have zero, and you see here that the duration of kangaroo position goes on the positive side. The longer the duration of kangaroo position, more gray matter volume controlling by severity and by sex. So this is R squared 20 percent years later. I would like to remind you that these tests were done 20 years later. Here we show the same, but with the subcortical gray matter where there we have, we need to consider coordination, memory, and other variables. Here you have the striatum, volume, putamen, and other nuclei that are related to motricity. You see that the duration of the kangaroo position is somewhat positive and important in this model with regard to the volume of the striatum. Look at the cerebral amygdala. Amygdala is responsible for emotions, especially fear and emotions. And these structures are especially vulnerable to injury in premature term labor. Here I put the interpretation because I introduced the days at the NICU. So you control for severity and sex. More days in the intensive care, you see that less days, more volume of the amygdala. The duration of kangaroo position doesn't seem to be very important, but when you mix it with intensive care, the more days of intensive care, the more kangaroo, more amygdala volume. So we need to start that child who goes to the ICU, we tell the mother, I need you here. And here we look at a variable, which is the internalization of the child who has a preterm sequela seen by the parents. You have more amygdala, this deterioration. Very interesting. Therefore, I want to analyze all the neuroimages. This is the externalization, which is also a preterm sequela with the, the internalization and externalization. You can see the impact of the intensive care and the impact of the interaction with the duration in days of kangaroo position and of the externalization. Then we look at the sample volume and memory, which is very sensitive to hypoxia. So the, the preemie has a higher risk of hypoxia. And the preemie tours have lower volume compared to term infants. And this has been published, of course. The right hippocampus is involved in visual spatial memory that we assess with VMI test. And the, what is the left hippocampus is involved in verbal memory. So we wanted to be with the intensive care. You see the same result. You see the verbal memory with the VLT test. 
So you see that more days in the ICU, less volume in the hypocampus. The position in ICU helps to have more volume, less intrusion and more volume. And we look at the other hippocampus with visual memory and this have the same result. Very interesting. But we also want to look at white matter. I, so the white matter, you have mechanical ventilation with the volume of the corpus callosum or procedure. Corpus callosum is a significant association. So I remind you that the callos, corpus callosum are the fibers that go from left to right. Longer the fibers, we look at motor activity. So the shorter of this test of NHPT, the shorter, the better the fine motor, and the fibers are longer. And you see where the duration of the kangaroo position goes in days. I was curious, and I took the worst of this test to see if this was an anatomic reality or these are just statistical models. Look at this corpus callosum of the worst one. Look at the holes. This is what is in the mid portion of the brain that goes from right to left, or from left to right. Look at these holes. It's all interrupted. It's fatal, corpus callosum. And here I see ones that have good outcomes in motor development and good fibers. And one day to see how they look. Look at this. The, they have nice fibers. What is the conclusion? That everything that we do has a consequence. When we have this small child that's going to stay in our hands, everything that we do can be seen 20 years later. So think the kangaroo position as a, as a brain surfactant or a neuroprotector drug like the lung surfactant. And so the kangaroo position for brain has a long-term effect. It depends on the dose. It's important to start as early as possible to protect this brain. And perhaps we could have brain of the same size or if extreme preterm baby. It's normal to have this insecurity. We need to learn kangaroo method and we need to work closely with parents, make them responsible, put them to work. And I must say that they're never an obstacle. The obstacle are the health professionals. We need to acknowledge the supportive role of parent associations. So I conclude that we need to have this at the third of the intensive care unit instead of having timetable. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Natalia, for your presentation, always with so much emotions of empowerment of planet. You have clearly told us that preterm children are an emergency, global emergency, and that we need interventions now. And it is true because it affects the situation of the child and its future. And we can intervene. And that is to point out, to close the gaps, and that everything that we do has consequences. I think that this approach of family makes the difference. Once again, thank you very much to you. So I have to thank the people that are connected. We're not going to have an active post because there are many questions. We thank to everyone who has connected from the Ministries of Health. That's a large part of neonatologists. From the Andean countries, we have Argentina, Belize, Bolivia, Chile, Colombia, Cuba, Ecuador, Spain, Guatemala, UK, Mexico, Nicaragua, Paraguay, Peru, Uruguay, Venezuela, among others. 
We receive many greetings. Thank you very much. During this development of the webinar, uh, participants have sent many questions. Sometimes we cannot answer all of them and we, we will answer them later. We're going to change the dynamic before reading the question from the audience and thanking Dr. Pers Ashton, Dr. Morges, and Dr. Tarpak. I'm going to invite you to have any questions, those who in the room. Dr. Natalie, you had a question to Dr. Ashhorn. I, I think that I'm very scared to think that the rate of prematurity has not changed in the world, the world. And I see this in Latin America, especially many children who are born and I cannot find the indication. So I think I think that it would be good to focus on this with the collaboration of the obstetricians and the gynecologists, because I think that that will reduce significantly the rate of prematurity. I'm very scared with that because sometimes they make more money if we see sections, less risk, less pain, and the outcomes are the outcomes are many premature. What would you do as a strategy to consider this issue that generates prematurity? Go ahead, Dr. Per. <laughs> well, I, thank you, thank you, Dr. Per. Esa fue toda una discusión con el grupo neonatal. That was a discussion with a neonatal group. So one of the first actions is to get together with the area of sexual and reproductive health. Go ahead, Dr. Per. Yeah, yeah, you already said a very important uh, issue on it, and I think. I'm a pediatrician myself, so I have been on the other side and been practicing neonatology. And, and for a long time, I also sort of thought that uh, we need to invest in the care. And I think it, I've been uh, very positively impressed by the how the technology has now gone even into low, low, low income settings and we can do all the CPOPs and many things. But somehow uh, that has perhaps taken the focus out of the fact that every fourth baby is born like that. And if you have, like in a Kenyan, we had a Kenyan launch and a Ministry of Health person said that, well, if in a car factory, somebody finds out that every fourth Mercedes is it comes out somehow faulty and too small, you don't invest only in fixing those tires and doing, you go to the production line and think, what can you do? And I think exactly like you said, Dr. Villata, we, we should work, work together. And of course, these are not medical questions. These are social science questions. What can we do to prevent? But I think we should really work together on, on that, that, that part. Uh, and, and there will always be need for care. There will always be need for prevention. We have to work together on those things. I also have a question to Dr. Charpak, if I may. Adelante, okay. Well, my question is, is that what is the biological mechanism that you think that is increasing the size of amygdala and hippocampus and everything like that? Is it, is it somehow, does it go to, through cortisol and, and less stress hormones when you provide kangaroo mother care? Why does it increase brain size? Why is it a surfactant for a brain? <laughs> well, I think that this is a very good question. I look at the outcome, but I agree. I would think more in the stress and everything that can be created, what this stress can create. If you remember, I'm, I'm old, so 
this triad when they look the suture, the squamous suture as an index that when the child was in the hospital in neonatology, the brain stopped growing and so that you could palpate the sutures. So I think that this brain needs an, a less a, a, a environment that's not stressed. I, I cannot put it back in the mother's womb. So I need to recreate an environment where we need to give all that technology. So at the same time, we need to decrease everything. As Volpe mentioned in the article, we need to look at pain, light, noise. The need cap absorbs the kangaroo mm. as a tool that can help. I think, and in addition, by doing that, I changed the mother because the parents are not an obstacle. Once you explain them what can kangaroo do, they are there, ready. But sometimes I don't have the tool to put them there. So I believe that I, I can, I, I change the parents that are gonna be the future because they are the ones that are gonna provide the simulation and at the same time, you give an adequate environment. For example, the nice thing, and we have published that the child, when they regulate temperature, as for the discharge from the kangaroo by itself, they don't tolerate 24 hours. So is to re replace the physiology in a place where they feel, they feel better. Mm -hmm. Less stress. That's my interpretation. Now, you have to do tons of studies, of course, mother's cortisol, a child, etc. Yeah, the evidence can lead to actions. Thank you, both Dr. Per and Dr. Natalie. There are questions from the audience. Yes, we have the Neonatal Alliance. If they would like to ask a question, you're welcome. Dr. Per, they have asked, what are the most important implications of the study for public health policies related to neonatal care in low resource environments? Could this study influence in the allocation of resources to improve neonatal care in countries with underdeveloped health systems? I don't think the direct implications are on neonatal care. They are more on actually, because our emphasis in this series is not on the care, it's on the prevention. So it's more like I think the, the risk might be that some politicians are going to say in this country that we don't want to invest in NICOs, we want to invest in antenatal care. That's not our message. Our message is that you, in addition to the NICOs, you need to invest in antenatal care. But other, other than that, what we hope is that if you do what we are recommending, provide everybody with good nutrition and, and multiple micronutrients and and uh, screen for uh, asymptomatic urinary tract infections, the neonatologist will have a little bit less patience and they can focus more on some others. And one thing that I think I would like to still mention to Dr. Charbak, I really appreciate the notion that we are actually increasing, we not, it's actually the obstetrician, the iatrogenic preterm delivery, that is becoming a big problem in the world, that we are helping the babies to be born too early. And I think that's a joint issue that we should all work on. There's a lot of data that 38 weeks is not the full-term baby. That uh, for a long, many American Academy of Obstetricians wanted to move the the limit to 39 weeks, and now there's a call in early term between 37 and 39 because those babies still have an increased risk for various adverse outcomes. Roger? Acá hay dos preguntas también relacionadas con el estudio. Dice, ¿qué recomendaciones específicas harían a los... What specific recommendations would you do to them? To those responsible 
of having public policies through neonatal care based on the findings from your study and how can collaboration among different holders such as governments, NGOs, and the private sector improve the neonatal care in areas with limited resources. Was this, this was again about neonatal care, so I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm not in the position to answer, answer the question best. I think my colleagues, Dr. Morg and Dr. Charpak would be in a better position to, to comment. Sí, adelante, es para, para todos. También, ah, sí. Mónica puede ser. Sí, y hay una pregunta relacionada, <laughs> doctora Mónica, dice. Sí. sí. ¿Cuál es la pregunta? ¿Cuáles son los desafíos más importantes que los profesionales de salud en la región con un trabajo efectivo en el neonatal a riesgo? A ver, eh. Neonatal, a ver, ¿cuál es el Gracias por la pregunta, la verdad que las dos preguntas son enormes. Uh -huh. eh, con respecto al par, al, al, a la prevención de parto prematuro... Con respecto a la prevención de parto prematuro, el mundo ha mostrado que estas multifactoriales de estrategias no son muy promisantes. Cuando, cuando, por ejemplo, hay protocolos... Cuando hay protocolos protocol for care during pregnancy and early uh, evaluation of prematurity. In those cases, we're going to have an impact because it, the, the neck length is correlated with that. But what happens if in the population that we're working, they have a pregnancy control that's sufficiently adequate as to the health team can investigate that child. So there is an issue of access and coverage that is independent of premature labor because that is work in general for other pathology it has to do with culture and everything and other things. So it also gets complicated with the age of the mother. In Latin America, we have more and more teenage pregnancies. So there, there is an intervention to be done. Independent, uh, regardless of the of the patient getting there and looking at the length of the neck. And I don't know if I explain myself. It's so multifactorial and so intimately related to culture and development of the populations in, rela in relation to self-care and the timely consultation, that, that's what, what needs to be considered. It's not something specific because this goes across all the health problems of the mother and the child and of everything. Now, with regard to the question of the challenges to follow up, well, the challenges are what I mentioned in my presentation for to be a timely diagnosis if that child is poor in nutrition or neurodevelopment in behavior. If we're facing an autistic spectrum disorder or later on, if the child has some learning disabilities or language disabilities, for that, we have follow-up because where they have the family, because this is a family center care and follow-up, because if we don't have the family, then that forces us to educate them about all the topics so the parents know what they're dealing with. There's a lot of education component. The problems are the most important ones, I believe, are those related to the difficulties that the patients are under control because culturally speaking, the people is used to curative medicine. So 
areas where we have a significant challenge. It is also difficult and makes the follow-up very difficult is a lack of professionals that have the sufficient expertise to make diagnosis and rehabilitation. Let, let me finish, please. As I mentioned, the teams need to be organized. For example, there are different solutions. The solution of the kangaroo care up to two years that you have in Colombia is wonderful. We have other strategy, and now we are trying to include that strategy, kangaroo strategy, because of the impact it has. But the interdisciplinary teams have to get out of this university conception and understand that medicine is not just a doctor, but they have to train other specialists with occupational therapies, kinesiologists, audition hearing specialists. So this is also a cultural change of how the universities in the region are reorganized in order to produce these professionals that can respond to this need on the demand for care and the depth of the knowledge that they need to acquire. I just want to add two things about each one of the questions. In Colombia, there are areas where 90% of preterms come from cesareans, C-sections. Ones are justified, others not. But they're not professional midwives. And sometimes they don't respect the professional midwife. You have a country where the follow is by the obstetrician, it's going to be a C-section. But if the follow-up is by a midwife, it's going to be a natural delivery. So I think that here we need to work in order so that C-section is an indication because of a pathology. The second thing about follow-up, in Colombia we have 60, we have kangaroo unit, kangaroo in many units, but the kangaroo program has a follow-up up to a year or two years, there are 60 that cover access of 65% of all the children who are born every year. This is a cost-effective measure because, of course, these are somewhat centralized in the regions because you cannot have a retinologist in each health facility. So you need to centralize but in, in an intelligent way, supporting the parents to come so they can have a better coverage. And the goal is to be zero blindness, to do a timely detections of the problems of the development so we can intervene. And the fact that this cost effective helps because what follow up helps, but the cost is, is important. And that goes with a level of development of the country. When people start of being concerned, not only of saving lives, but also that that life has a quality, this is a major leap in development. It's very interesting. It's a lot of work that we need to do. Thank you very much. You have no idea the questions that have been sent in those topics in how to approach these social cultural issues and how to approach the system of qualified human resources because that requires teams, budget, policies, and norms. So your comments on those strategies. Now are the current situations, but what strategies have you implemented or you know of that to, to deal with interculturality in the timely response of human resources. I will start with the answer. Well, in my country, 
as you know, we are well organized in that regard. With the health reform, what we did with educate the population in the 56 pathologies that children, that children get ill or for. And then in time they increase and now we have 80. So all the citizens and migrants that we, they all have the education or at least the capacity of being, being educated if they go to a health facility. And that is the issue because the access is a great limiting factor. I can have the best health policy, but it, it doesn't reach to the target population, useless. So here is where from the point of view of the media, this is important. So we advertise through the media with regards to respiratory infections, as the right to timely diagnosis of these 80 diseases through the health reform with explicit guarantees. I guarantee a consultation for any of these issues. And you're going to have the care that you deserve regardless of your economic conditions, regardless of your area of residence, just by the fact of living in Chilean territory. This is a major leap and we need to be permanently teaching and educating that they have right, that they have access to ask and what are the risks. I think, and this is my personal view, that if we taught less differential equations in schools and more this type of things, we will have a population that's more educated in the sense of self-protection and the timely consultation. The children need to be cared. There has to be no aggression on them. And this is much more important. Student in the last two years, can, it's more important that they can solve quadratic equations because quadratic equations can be learned later if they like math at university. But what he or she is not going to be able to learn when they study at the university or a technical school, not going to be able to deal with these things that have to do with behavior culture. And when we learn and understand that behavior culture is what's going to produce this change, there, we're going to have a population that has access so they understand that they go and take care of themselves and control and So we need to start from more. Thank you. Uh, Marcela, I have to leave. We know that you are driving but would you leave us a final message? We we'll continue with a, with two more questions, but Dr. Monica, before you leave, what is your final message for the audience? My final message is that we need to get organized and the organization to care for the high-risk child goes through education on the population to have a education and health intervention as early as possible. So we can educate at the age of 12 in the school to, to boys and girls. We're going to see that they're going to take care of themselves. They're going to self-determine in what they want for their lives because culturally they're going to have the adequate tools and not in what we do now, that we are blind in this regard. We don't want to see. So we continue 
with a teenage pregnancy, the pregnancy controls, good nutrition. That I believe is a paradigm change to educate our boys, girls, and adolescents. That's my f final message. The rest of we can achieve with the organization of follow-up clinics is different, going to be different in each country because the health culture is different for each country and we need to get trained. That is a, a very important yes, to our institution. You can get trained at a low cost and be able to investigate the problems of the high-risk children in a timely fashion, not expensive. And from our institution, we want to do the major change in the Latin American region. Thank you very much. We would like to share that information. Thank you so much, Dr. Natalie. We have seen the advantages of the kangaroo program. What are those strategies that are required to strengthen for its implementation with the community participation and parent participation and the society at large? Go ahead, please. Well, I think that at the level of government, important would be to understand that we need to learn of what we have. We don't have to reinvent all the way. So the interesting thing in Colombia is that there are private and public insurance companies that discover that with the kangaroo method the adequately implemented, there was a decrease in their costs. I don't want to be cynical, but I am sure that that was something that was very important in in making this kangaroo program popular in Colombia. They told me that, so I'm convinced that we need to learn from there. And we know that the, kang the well-implemented kangaroo method, hopefully from birth and then in the neonatal care and then the kangaroo position, we need to learn how to do it. And then this minimal follow-up to one year to which this high-risk child has the right to is cost-effective, it can be done, and that is what we want to transmit. We've been transparent in that regard. How do we learn or how you can learn? Well, I think that you learn with, if you want to do things quickly, with virtual courses, one of the centers can be exposed to a center that works, so you can teach how people do and how to start showing in their own country how you do, you create these units, like a spider web, and I think that that works. It does work, and we have to do it because the kangaroo method has to be done with quality and there are indicators. Indicators are very important. There are some simple indicators that need to be considered in order to evaluate the quality of what's being done. Thank you. And to conclude, Dr. Per Ashorn, a final message, please, for this webinar. Yeah, well, I... I don't know if I can say a final message, but if I may comment on your question to Dr. Chorapak uh, on how to expand kangaroo mother care. I am a pediatric infectious disease physician and I work with lots with children with diarrhea. And uh, when I started my specialization in 1990, uh, all hospitals were still in Finland using intravenous rehydration of children because this is how we used to do Somebody had heard of an oral rehydration, but that was considered a low income country technology, which was useless for us in rich countries. And slowly we started speaking so much that it is much better, it's medically better, it is more safe, it is, it is number one choice for all of us. 
And slowly we could change those things. And I think it's the same thing with kangaroo mother care. We should say this is the right treatment. You shouldn't separate the people. This is not the low income technology that they can use when they don't have money for the rich things. This is what we also do. And I think slowly it changes. That was one of the messages. And the sort of the other thing I think is that, yes, I, I again, going back to what I said at the beginning, that the newborns are our future. The small ones are the most vulnerable. They are the ones whom we should help. And we should work hand in hand, providing care and doing the prevention. We will need both. And they will, there's a medical part to it and there's a social part to it. In the same way, there's a social part to the kangaroo mother care. I think that's my message. Back to you, Dr. Vilalta. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Natalie, your final message. Well, I think that doctor is right, but that means that 20 or 30 years from now to achieve that, either there's a change in practice. The major difficulty is to change the practice in doctors, nurses. That's a major obstacle. But I do believe that the mother kangaroo method has to be routinely used on all prematures in rich or poor countries. Here, we don't see any differences. Every level. This is it's wonderful for neonatal transport in an area where a child is born like that. So I think that we need to continue like you mentioned in in the webinar as advertisement presentations until we let everyone understand that kangaroo is evidence-based, is benefit, benefit for all, everyone, the child, the family, the hospital, the society, everyone wins. And despite that, there's a difficult inertia. That's why we selected science to convince, but that's not enough either. The example we need to you need to follow because this is the best for these babies. <laughs> yes, <laughs> kangaroo doesn't exclude technology. It has to be clear that it has to be routine what they routine what they need the most. Thank you, Dr. Natalie. Well, this has been a very good meeting. And to close, I'm going to invite Dr. Maricela Malki, our Deputy Secretary of our institution. Go ahead, Dr. Maricela. Thank you very much, Marianela. I would start by thanking Dr. Bert Ashron, Dr. Monica Borges, and Dr. Natalie Charpak for the wonderful presentation. You have shown evidence, each one of you. And that is what we need to what Dr. Charpak mentioned, change in the management. The evidence that we've seen today related to this so important topics as a small vulnerable newborns, a concept that Dr. told us that they are low birth weight children, premature babies and small for gestational age. And it's unfortunate to hear that the rates of birth in the world are not decreasing after so many years of effort, despite the global commitment, as it has been mentioned in the week, one out of four children have this, are born with these convictions, small and vulnerable. This is a problem of human rights and public health. You also show the multifactoriality of this issue, and therefore it demands a multi-sectorial, interdisciplinary, multi-level intervention, political decisions that will lead to this approach, as you have magnificently showed. Them. We have seen the sequelae on the short, medium, and long term in the neurological development that can 
be generated in this premature birth. That unfortunately, there are several factors. You mentioned multiple pregnancies and something important is induced prematurity. We, was, we were told that 90% of C-section, 90% of births in Colombia were C-section. Some of them probably justified, but others not. But this is what we see. We are working for comfort of the professionals and not thinking in the newborn. And that I think is important. And for that, you've shown us a diversity, a variety of evidence, impact and the sequelas on the long term. You've shown follow-up studies up to 20 years of the difference someone who is born with a gestational age and, and those who's not that way. In that regard, it's been very important information and strategy that Natalie showed us that spreads and motivates to make progress in this area because we have evidence and that is important. In medicine, we always need to be looking at evidence as a study has been shown in the Lancet with all the epidemiology and the characteristics of the newborns that are small and vulnerable. Once again, our thanks for your time, for your sharing with us, your knowledge, your progress, and this topic of neonatology is one of the priority lines work in the Andean Health Organization with six countries, Bolivia, Chile, Colombia, Ecuador, Venezuela, and Peru. We have 170 million inhabitants, and this issue is significant. Once again, thank you to our wonderful speakers, Marianela, the team of Orozconu, all who have contributed to the development of these webinars, that we can continue positioning this topic. It is important to continue talking about this topic, showing evidence, so the political decisions at different levels can implement policies that favor so the multifactorial. We invite you to the next Thursday at this time to the next webinar where we're going to talk about women's health through the course of life. We're close to the day with the International Women's Day. Once again, thank you and see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.